on today's show, James Harden is reportedly torn between his free agency decisions of Philadelphia and staying put or coming home to Houston. And things are maybe starting to look like Harden is leaning towards staying in Philadelphia. Plus, what about Fred Van Vliet as a plan B option if things don't work out pursuing James Harden, as well as some other free agency names and some creative ways that the Rockets might approach this offseason. It's all coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green, Alperon Shengun, and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Hey, Houston fans, I am so happy. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two... One. Zero. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on NBA for $20 off your very first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on the way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for making LOR part of your day every single day. Joining us now is your weekly co-host, none other than the pod father himself, Rockets Wire editor and host of the Logger Line podcast, Ben DuBose. You can track down on Twitter at Ben DuBose. And man, we've got the free agency scuttlebutt. It's just all the rumors are firing up, Ben. And we've got a report from Sham Sharania of The Athletic that James Harden is apparently torn between choosing Houston as his free agency destination or staying put in Philadelphia. And for what has seemed to be, you know, a couple months now, it's almost been like this foregone conclusion amongst Rockets fans and NBA circles, all this that James Harden would be coming back to Houston. A lot of people have chalked it up to it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when, not if. And we've spoken ad nauseum on this very podcast about the fact that there are a lot of variables at play and that's not yeah. necessarily as much of a guarantee as NBA circles are kind of portraying it to be based on conversations that we've had and kind of the, I guess the concerns maybe from the rocket side of things, because it's not just a foregone conclusion that, Oh, if James wants back in Houston, he's going to come home. Right. I mean, I think they would welcome him back under the right terms but look, a four-year max deal is going to carry him into his age 37 season, and that's a year for the Rockets in which all four of your first-round draft picks, or I suppose your mid-to-high first-round draft picks from the last couple of draft cycles, Jabari Smith Jr., Tari Eason, Jalen Green, Alperin Shingun, by that fourth year, all of them will be on their second NBA contracts, and many, if they pan out as we hope, will be on substantially raised contracts because their play warrants that. And then you add in $50 million or probably more than that, given how salaries escalate over these contracts to a 37 year old James Harden, who's on the decline. I never bought that the Rockets were willing to do that. I've never heard quite frankly from the Rockets that they were. And so it just feels like a lot of the national reporting throughout this process, as soon as we had the report on Christmas that Harden was potentially interested in coming back to the Rockets. And of course, there'd be some level of interest on the Rockets side. If you're talking about adding a top 20 player to a team that's this bad in a season in which we know they want to start winning, of course, the Rockets are going to hear him out. It would be silly for them not to. But this idea, there, there's a huge gulf between hearing him out and having some interest with give him the keys to the franchise, give him a four-year max give him the ability to trade young pieces for win-now veterans. We've seen this idea perpetuated in a number of places that maybe the Rockets would trade their high lottery pick number four this year for a win-now veteran, which I find completely asinine. And the Rockets have pushed back on this every time that I've talked to them that, look, James Harden, if he comes, is a bridge. It's about getting you to a point over the next two to three years to where by the middle part of this decade, 
guys like Jalen Green and Alperin Shingun and Jabari Smith are able to fully take the keys and run with this operation. It's about putting them in a better spot than they are now, getting them into more competitive environments, and so on and so forth. It was never about making James Harden the focal point of your franchise. That just does not make sense with Harden, who's turning 34, year old, 34 years old this summer, and a Rockets team coming off a 22-60 and 60 year, being one of the worst two in the league in each of the last three seasons. It just does not make sense for the Rockets to be that desperate to have him. So with that in mind, if the Rockets aren't willing to offer him the four-year max or give him the types of personnel control that he had in the past, then sure, it makes sense for him to explore the market otherwise. Maybe there's a team that's willing to do that in terms of money or control. The Sixers would seem to be a strong candidate because it's not like they can directly replace him. Or even if he really wants Houston, then it makes sense for Harden to explore the market and perhaps use those other teams as leverage against the Rockets and say, look, I don't have to come here. I do have this option. And then see if maybe the Rockets cave on some of these fronts. I hope they don't, but that's quite frankly, what goes into these negotiations. So I just think that this whole process, there's been, as soon as it was reported that there was mutual interest between Harden and the Rockets, there was just this baseline assumption from people who don't know the specifics of the Rockets situation that, oh, the Rockets would just give him the keys to the franchise, whatever he wants in terms of years, money, control, that never makes sense. I think the Rockets want him conditionally. And now that we're getting into the final month before free agency, those conditions are starting to be, are coming to light and now the Harden camp is sort of having to deal with the reality that hey they're not getting everything from Houston so whether it's for leverage or whether it's genuinely looking at other options it, it makes sense for them to do so yeah I, I kind of got the feeling that the Harden camp maybe throughout all of this thought that they had like a slam dunk in returning right. to Houston right where it, where their perception was oh we'll just say we want to go back to Houston and then that'll force Philly to cough up the four years 200 million and then Houston was like hey pump the brakes there guys we're not so uh jumpy at pulling the trigger on a four-year you know 200 million dollar max contract for James we can have a discussion about this and that's when they go oh crap well that was our <laughs> that was our our ticket to making sure that Philly offered the max so that James could maybe stay in a winning situation and like have his cake and eat it too yep. right and you know have the max still be playing you know at, oh, I don't know all of this is just and nationally people aren't paying attention to the Rockets enough to know the nuance of the situation. Yeah. They're talking to James and his people because the Sixers are relevant. No one's really paying attention to the Rockets. So the angles that Houston is going to have to look into with regards to the terms of a deal and the trade-offs of one are inherently going to be a bit underreported until you get really down to the wire and the nitty gritty of these negotiations. And now that we're in June, we're finally getting to that point. Yeah, and, and look, I, I have every confidence that they are not going to pull the trigger on a four-year, $200 million max. I, I never thought Same. that it made sense and in the conversations that I've had, they're clearly, they understand that they have a need for bringing in a point guard, which is why we're also going to be talking about here in just a moment, the idea of potentially bringing in Fred Van Vliet as a different option if the James Harden situation does not pan out for the Rockets. They clearly need some type of a floor general, a legitimate NBA level point guard. And I think that bringing in Ime Odoka, I think maybe he has, you know, we, we've d discussed the level of a voice that he has in that room, in the, you know, Rockets war room, making decisions, all that stuff. I'm sure he has some level of input in wanting to bring in uh, that type of player to help run his system. So, mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, especially with Rafael Stone's comments the other day, right, about bringing in a guy that matches the yes. vision for Ime Odoka. Uh, to me, James Harden does not necessarily mesh with what Ime Odoka would want to potentially achieve as a head coach here in Houston. So I think that was just yet another, uh, you know, uh, another tea leaf, if you will, that we can read into to kind of understand, hey, the James Harden situation is not guaranteed. Again, maybe if they can come to terms on a team-friendly deal, if – the 76ers yeah. play play hardball with Harden too much and they're not willing to offer what he thinks is a fair deal for his services, then maybe he is still, you know, gonna try to return to Houston for all the reasons, all the off court stuff that we've discussed before, as well as if Houston is willing to pony up a little bit more money than the 76ers. But at this point, it is anything but a guarantee. And so we're gonna be we're still gonna have a lot of reporting between now and free agency over these next few weeks to see what ultimately happens. But 
around the corner, another possibility for the Houston Rockets, a name that has been floated around before, the idea of Fred Van Vliet. We'll kind of unpack what that might look like and the type of impact he might be able to have on this Houston Rockets team as a backup plan to James Harden, if you will. We're going to get there in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Look, buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. You're trying to go out and have a good time. You don't need to be stressed about how you're going to buy these tickets. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all these sports, music, comedy, and theater events happening near you. They've got flash deals on last-minute tickets. It's easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. They've got images of seat views so you know exactly the type of bang you're getting for the buck that you're spending. Lowest price guarantee, event cancellation, all the good stuff. It's the fastest-growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. So snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the Game time app, create an account, and use code locked on NBA for $20 off your very first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code locked on NBA for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Ben, one of the names that has popped up regarding the Houston Rockets uh, in their potential free agency pursuits, we'll get to some of the other names here in just a moment, the the Brooke Lopez's, the Cam Johnson's, regrettably the Dylan Brooks's of the world. <laughs> but uh, Fred Van Vliet was always, you know, like a couple pegs lower on like the interest list, I think, for the Rockets, because mm. obviously all eyes have been focused on James Harden for a majority of this offseason, ever since the season actually came to an end for the Rockets. And rightfully so, right? You've already pointed out he's a top 20 player. He fits a position of need for this Houston Rockets team. Getting him, if you could get him on a team-friendly type deal, something that isn't, you know, some type of an albatross contract, he'd be a great get. Fred Van Vliet, occupies the same position, would fill a position of need, would kind of accomplish a lot of the same things that James Harden would do, albeit just not quite to the level that James Harden does said things on the basketball court. Uh, My concern with the potential of pursuing a Fred Van Vliet instead of a James Harden always came out to be, well, if James would cost you like 50 a year or or slightly below Mm -hmm. that, if you're going to give him the max... I mean, how much cheaper are we going to talk about Fred yeah. Van Vliet? Like, is he going to cost you 40 a year? Because at the difference... You yeah, know- I mean, I think Fred Van Vliet's max is four years, $180 million. Not saying he's going to get every penny of that. But if it's anywhere close, there's really not a huge delta. Yeah, so why, like at that point, why would you... I, I would not turn my nose up at the idea of paying James Harden $6 million more a year if, if the alternative was paying Fred Van Vliet yeah. a max for all those same years, which again, I think because of so many of the variables that we're considering here, the likelihood of getting James Harden to give you maybe a team friendlier kind of discount or yes. slightly less years or any of these other variables is greater than Fred Van Vliet, who would probably balk at anything other than a four year max. Yeah. And you do have to keep in mind with some of these reports, Houston is a classic team that agents can leverage because they have so much cap room And everyone knows the Rockets are heavily incentivized to try and win big starting next season because they don't own their own draft capital until 2027. So it makes sense, even if a guy like Fred Van Vliet isn't interested in the Rockets, to leak that potentially he could be because just having Houston as a suitor might scare Toronto or any other team into bidding a bit more because they know the Rockets do have a lot of money and they are incentivized to try and spend it this offseason. So a lot of these reports, Houston could just be used in a way, in terms of agents just seeing them as useful to their clients. Rockets now, are going to be involved in every leak from here until I know. J- July 1st. Sort of like, remember when the Sixers were in the, in the process years and like the mid-2010s when they had all that cap room and yeah. it felt like every free agent, people were saying, oh, you know, Philly's a dark horse. And then it never happened, but it's just, they just sort of lurked because big market with all this money, it, it can't hurt to throw them in the mix and see if it can perhaps scare the team you actually want to go to or the free agent wants to go to into bidding a bit more, offering an extra year or something like that. Look, Fred definitely defends at a higher level than Harden does. So on that side of the floor, it actually be a cleaner fit for Udoka. It's someone with Van Fleet who you can actually, I don't know if he's quite 94 feet like Pat Bev, but it can actually pick up far away from the three-point line and he, play he's, that type he's of, a good point of attack defender and he comes yeah. from a toronto system with nick yeah. nurse that, that won the title physical style played yes. at a high level right he, he's from that he can embody all the same principles that udoka yeah. would want to as instill a, here yeah as opposed to james even though he's a point guard we know he's pretty much a post defender you don't want to thrust a lot of responsibility on him in terms of perimeter defense he was never that guy and he's especially not going to be that guy in his mid to late 30s so on that side of the of the court 
he might actually be a better fit. But offensively, yeah, James is just a clearly superior player. Better shooter, better playmaker, better passer. He just does so many more things than Fred does. And so it just comes down to the value. Again, but, I think it's But one- playing devil's advocate here, yeah. When you look at Fred, right, so many some of the concerns, and I voiced these the la- last week when we were together, Ben, some of the concerns with Harden, right, stem from you're committing yourself to a, a very clear, distinct play style, right? You are going to be playing, for mm-hmm. lack of better terminology, Harden ball. And I, you don't have to play that way with Fred, right? He is a table-setting point guard. He's a guy that can— I wouldn't even know, say he's a table-setting point guard, but he's less rigid than Harden is. I yes. mean, okay, for, for well, I don't know. Like, I, I, I think he does ha, did a good job during the championship run for the Raptors, right, deferring to and, you know, setting up guys. And he was kind of the spark plug off the— bench behind Kyle Lowry that year but even yeah. at times they ran like a two guard lineup with him and Lowry at the same mm-hmm. time he is a shooter I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to call him a shoot first point guard is the problem yeah. um, I think he's somewhere kind of in the middle between those two uh, you know point guard ideologies if you will and to me that is the kind of like veteran floor presence however you want yeah. to classify him as a point guard that could really benefit all these he- young guys uh, you know alongside Ime Odoka of course he does give you more optionality in terms of your playing style. Yeah. Yes. Now the flip side with Harden is that even if there's less optionality with your style, just his overall value as a player is so much. And like the idea floor that he's just goes get, up. <laughs> yeah. He's going to get you more wins that it goes back to that debate. We've had plenty of times about, is it worth it? Even if the style of play for the team isn't exactly what you might want. If it just gets you more wins in a more competitive environment for your young prospects, your young core to develop in. Look, as far as Fred, the difficulty I have in seeing the fit is this. He strikes me as the kind of guy with no connection to Houston that you're probably going to have to overpay to get him to sign here. And the bottom line is with the Rockets, their contending window isn't going to open for, I would say, at least another two and probably three to four years. So the odds are by that point, Fred will be 32, 33. He's 29 now. And even if he's not declining by then, which he might be, at a bare minimum, he would be getting into his next contract. And you'd have to go through another round of negotiations to see if you can keep him. Is it worth paying a premium over a time period that you're not going to win the championship anyway when conceivably you could have James Harden who might sign a shorter deal based on his connections to Houston. And that's one thing that I think is becoming increasingly clear in the Harden negotiations. I don't think James has the four-year max he's hoping for from anyone. I think Philly, as we've talked about, has made it clear with hiring Nick Nurse and not Mike D'Antoni and now letting Sam Cassell go. That was James's closest confidant. There are limits in Philly. Even with Gerald Morey, he's not giving Harden the keys the way he used to in Houston. He acknowledged in the after-season press conferences we talked about last week that there's scenario A where James returns and there's scenario B where he doesn't. I don't think James has that offer from Philly. I don't think he does from Houston. And so because of that and his age, he might take a shorter deal that allows you into the market Again, in 2024, 2025, something like that, as opposed to Fred, at a bare minimum, I think you've got to give him four years, which will take you out of free agency at at that point, pretty much for the duration of this young core, assuming it pans out. Because by four years from now, again, Jalen, Shingun, Jabari, Tari, they're all going to be on their second deals. They're all hopefully going to be getting big, big raises because they're really good. So you do sort of lock yourself in a little bit and I'm not sure how good his trade value would be if you're paying him, you know, a four year deal worth, you know, 140, $150 million in total. So, and I did want to point out, you said you're paying a premium for Fred Van Vliet. Is it a premium if he's willing, if he's able to get that same contract or a max from another team? Like let's say the Rockets are team one and team B is also willing to give him a max, but he's, willing to choose Houston over that team. Is it still a premium in your eyes at that point to, to give him the max? Like, cause, not, cause you're talking about the, you're talking about the, like the loser tax, right? Like him having, yeah. like having to pay Maybe him not, more but to honest, come here. Yeah. I mean, I guess not in that scenario, but number one, I'm curious how many teams is it just two? If it's two, it's still an outlier in terms of trade value. Okay, that's and beyond that, I'm just sort of skeptical that a, a guy with no ties to Houston would choose the Rockets in that scenario, that loser tax, as you mentioned. Maybe he has a great relationship 
with Ime Udoka. We can hope for that. Ime does seem to be really liked around the league, but I just think that he's the classic kind of guy that gets linked to the Rockets because they have a lot of cap space. I do think if you moved heaven and earth in terms of offering him the max or close to it, that you could get him. However, I question if that's the best use of your cap space because, you know, Harden you might could get at a lower price point, at least in terms of years. And so you have more flexibility there. Or even if it's not Harden, look, there are conceivably other options. You could look on the trade market to use your cap room as sort of an asset that way. And, you know, Chris Paul is someone that could be available from Phoenix potentially given their cap crunch or the tax crunch, I believe it is. Mike Conley is someone that's been mentioned. There's all sorts of situations that you could explore around the league and potentially use all that cap room as an ability to maybe lower the price that you have to give a team in a trade because you're willing to take on that guy into your cap space and so give them the benefits of some financial flexibility in lieu of maybe the draft pick package that you would have to do otherwise. So there's other options besides just the free agents as well. We should throw out, I mean, Raphael Stone should be trying to get creative here. It's not like it's just the free agents. So yeah, my view on, on Fred and the same would be true with a lot of these unrestricted free agents that don't really have ties to Houston. Would I be open to it? Sure. But I'd be a little bit wary because I think for the Rockets, since it's not like you're going to, win the title or come close to it with whoever you sign this summer anyway, you have to think about how it sets you up for two, three, four years from now. Obviously with James Harden, for example, you don't want to give the four-year max because that fourth year, just the total team payroll would start to skyrocket to a point where it might cost you otherwise in terms of Tillman Fertitta not spending like Steve Ballmer and you have to make some hard decisions somewhere along the line. But the same thing is that, you know, if Fred has like negative trade value and you're not to a contending point yet, then maybe it makes sense to try and get someone who is going to be a lot easier to trade down the line, a deal that's a lot more value oriented. That's something that we heard from Raphael Stone. Since it's not like this deal is going to put you over the top, you have to think in terms of how it sets you up long term with your team building. So while I would be open to Fred in a vacuum, I'm just a bit wary that he would give the types of terms that it takes to be a value. And I think Houston is at a point in its rebuild where you still have to think to an extent about value in terms of overall money or years, because you do have to think, okay, this will help you get off the ground. But then two, three, four years from now, when we're trying to get from hopefully middle of the pack to actually contending, then are we going to be able to do that? And I'm not sure a max to Fred Van Fleet through his age 33 season is necessarily the best plan to do that. Give us your thoughts on Fred Van Vliet in the YouTube comments. How would you feel about the Rockets signing him if things don't work out, potentially pursuing James Harden? Coming up, I want to get into some of those creative potential scenarios of how the Rockets could utilize their cap space this offseason, as well as some of the other names that were mentioned in these reports surrounding the Houston Rockets. We're going to get there in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Next game, how about Nikola Jokic to score more than 26.5 points? What about Bam Adebayo to have less than 11.5 rebounds? How about Jimmy Butler to have more than 6.5 assists? Or what about Jamal Murray to have less than 4.5 three-pointers made? So what is prize picks? It's daily fantasy sports, but how does it work? Basically, you pick two to six players, and if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can work up to 25 times back on your money on any entry that you submit. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. And prize picks offers projections on any sport that you've watched. They've got you covered for the NBA Finals, NFL, MLB, NHL, you name it, they've got it over at Prize Picks. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. They're safe. They offer fast withdrawals. Currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. And right now, during the NBA Finals, one Prize Picks user will win a chance at becoming a millionaire. But you got to download the app to find out how. So download the Prize Picks app or go to PrizePicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. That means if you deposit $100, bucks, Prize Picks will give you $100. Bucks. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50. Bucks. Don't forget to enter promo code Locked On at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Ben, you mentioned not feeling super confident, right? If you were to give a four-year max to Fred Van Vliet, I kind of view it almost in the same 
line of thinking as how you've been kind of arguing the James Harden stuff for a while about the idea of bridging the gap, right? I don't think Fred okay. Van Vliet necessarily has to be the guy who is your point guard when the team is good again. And I think it's actually probably easier and you have maybe more runway to work with for the, you know, the bridging the gap, so to speak, because Van Vliet is younger, right? He's 29 right now. He would be 32, 33 by the end of his mm -hmm. contract, give or take. I think right now with Harden, you're expecting, okay, maybe he has, what, two more years tops as like a top 20, top 25 player. We're already starting to see some decline. He's missing games. He's not as explosive as he used to. At any moment, James, he's not going to keel over, but like at any moment, right, he could experience a very steep decline with his game. I think Fred Van Vliet is much further away from any like drop off a cliff randomly in his game. He had a really down year shooting the basketball, but other than that, like, He's still the guy he was when he helped the Raptors win a title, basically. I think sure. you get I think you get slightly more runway with him. And even if that means that the Rockets aren't competing for titles three, four years from now, again, at the very end of his deal, he you'd have some like intrinsic trade value because it's an expiring contract, that kind of thing. Same a lot of the same arguments we've made I would, about James Harden. I would just say quickly, sure. there is one more potential window within the next two years. Probably 2025 is more realistic because I don't know if how many true one-year deals that you could hand out. But conceivably, by 2025, you could open up max or close to max cap space again because that's the last year before the extensions for Jalen and Jabari would uh, go into effect. Uh, or, or no, no. let me let me think this through. So Jalen, yeah, with Jalen- Their extensions wouldn't kick in until year five. Because even when you sign the extension, the right, extension right, doesn't right. drop into year four, so it drops in year five. Yeah, so you would have one more chance if you go like the one to two year route. And then there's a year between Jalen and Shingoon and Jabari and Tari. Yeah. The, the point is by that fourth year, by the time that Jabari and Tari are added to Jalen and Shingoon, assuming these guys pan out, you're pretty much locked in. There is some wiggle room with one through three, and especially the optionality of the KPJ contract as well, if things don't work out, then you do potentially have another avenue in there to get another crack at free agency. Whereas if you go with Fred, I think you're much more, because I'm assuming he's going to get a four-year deal for sure based on his age, then you're you're much more locking yourself in. And maybe he's worth it. I mean, if you really believe in him and he ages well, then you'll have his bird rights. And who knows, maybe you can keep him and he can be your Kyle Lowry leading into you know the years in the late 2020s that we hope Houston is actually contending. It's just in my perfect world, I would have a bit more flexibility. And so that's why I've been sort of intrigued by the hardened path or some of these rentals because it's like you could work on I, I, sort I, of... I, well, I, but, but on that point, I guess that's kind of why, like, if you view Fred Van Vliet in, in a similar light as James Harden, he doesn't have to stick around the team after that four years is up, right? You're kind of viewing James as, okay, well, James would come here for two years, three years, maybe four years, whatever, and then he, like, uh, essentially, you, you send him on his merry way at the end of the contract, right? Because he's going to be 37, he's probably going to be you know, washed, whatever you want to call it, right? Or maybe he rides off into the sunset as, like, you know, the, the super sixth man off the bench as the young guys really start to take over and run the league. Right. But, like, I'm kind of viewing that as a similar thing for Fred Van Vliet, right? It's just he happens to be younger. Maybe he gives you 70% well, of what James Harden gives you, like on a good day. Um, well, I would agree with you when it comes to like four-year deals. Yes, I would give Fred Van Vliet a four-year deal before I would give James Harden a four-year deal. Yes, okay. I, I will meet you there. What I won't do is say give Fred Van Vliet a four-year deal as opposed to giving Harden a two-year deal because at the end of that two years, yeah. you have more optionality in terms of what you could do on the market as okay. opposed to at the end of the four years. That's where I'm saying you're a bit more mox, uh, boxed in based on the fact that the rest of your salaries are going to be so much bigger by that point. Okay, and I and I agree with that. I fully agree with that and I support that sentiment. Would you rather give Fred Van Vliet a four-year deal or kick the can down the road if you're the Houston Rockets right now? Because we've talked about this mm. possibility before. They've got the 60 million plus in cap space to work with right now. What they could conceivably do is give a bunch of balloon payments to a bunch of free agents and just bring guys in on one plus one deals, that kind of thing, and basically kick the can one more year down the road. Because we know that this next season is really going to be year one, right, of Ime Odoka being able to evaluate the talent on this Rockets roster, right? It's going to be his first chance to kind of see, okay, what is Jalen Green? What is Alperin Shingu? What is Jabari's 
Smith Jr. Which of these pieces can I identify as my one, two, three, four moving forward? And which of these guys are mainstays? Which of them are untouchables? And which one of the which which are the guys that we need to conceivably think about consolidating and moving via trade packages or whatever? The guys that aren't going to stick around that we're going to hopefully pay one day. So. You could do that because I think one of the fears, right, is maybe locking yourself into a bunch of like supporting cast type guys where maybe, you know, the Rockets have been linked to Brooke Lopez and Cam Johnson yeah. and Dylan Brooks and, you know, signing a bunch of those guys to three and four year long think- deals would would effectively box you in the same way that you're talking about, you know, yeah. committing all that money to Fred Although- Lee. Although I will say, the more I think about it, the, the more I think Brooke Lopez is really realistic, assuming he's willing to play for a non-contender. And he might be because he did get his ring in Milwaukee a couple yeah. of years ago. And with him being 35, I think there's much more of a path for him to take a two-year deal. I'm not saying it's a seamless fit because obviously there's only 48 minutes at center and both Brooke Lopez and Alper and Shingun are centers. And assuming that you don't want to play him just 24 minutes a piece, and I would be very disappointed by that, and Alper and Shingun in year three, then you're going to have to get creative, try to play a double big lineup at times, and then you get into the question of, well, can Jabari and Ortari play at the three? Not saying it's a perfect fit, but we heard from Ime at the introductory press conference that they want different types of bigs, which Brooke definitely is with his rim protection and his ability to shoot threes. And he's also at the age where a two-year deal is realistic. So it, t- it, it takes har- it takes the right type of veteran, right, yeah. to want to come so, into this situation. So whether it's Harden or Van Fleet, the more I think about it, Brooke Lopez is one guy that does check a lot of boxes. I'm not saying it's a perfect fit. Again, I understand that both he and Shingun ideally are centers only, and you do want at well, honestly, you want both of those guys to play more than 24 minutes per game at the price I assume Lopez would command. I'm guessing at least 20 million dollars or so per year, but. Again, it does come down to whether he's willing to play for a non-contender. The fact that he did recently win a ring might make him more willing to sort of chase the bag, if you will. But I do think that that's the one of that group that I think could work because he could fit both in terms of a short-term upgrade and the long-term optionality. That's one thing that, by the way, in in Shams's podcast with Ryan Rosillo, when he dropped the nugget about Harden being torn between the Rockets and 76ers. He actually mentioned the Rockets being aggressive in free agency. And he said it was in passing offering a lot of two-year deals. I think that actually ties into what we've been discussing. If we're talking about two-year deals, then that gives you one more bite at the apple before the extensions kick in, as opposed to when you give somebody a four-year deal. Again, it's sort of like either, I mean, you would have bird rights on that player, but you would lose a lot of your long-term optionality, especially if you're slightly overpaying them given that loser tax, as you called it. And then at that point, their trade value probably wouldn't be ideal either. So I do think that guys who could conceivably go on two years are going to be prioritized. Who knows? Maybe Dylan Brooks is in that market as well, given all of his obvious warts and, you know, the dents his reputation has taken. Maybe that makes him, even though he's just 27, more likely to take a short-term deal. But, but yeah, I think Shams throwing that two-year tidbit in. I think it definitely plays to Brooke Lopez. Maybe it does to Dylan Brooks as well. Yeah, and I, Brooke Lopez is a name that I, I've been hearing about the Rockets being interested in all the way back in like January. So this mm-hmm. is a guy that fits a lot of the, you know, checks a lot of the boxes for what they kind of need, gives them a different look at the five spot. Obviously, it's really tough to find, you know, more than 24 minutes a night for both he <laughs> and Alper and Shingun possibly, you know, in the lineup because they're both effectively just, just fives and can't really play, and- uh, you know, outside of that position. And one more thing I want to throw out there, uh, because I'm sure some people will hear us talking about James Harden, Fred Van Fleet, Brooke Lopez, Dylan Brooks, all these names and say, look, the Rockets only, I know it's only, I'm saying it in quotes, have $60 million in salary cap space. They could actually increase that to about 80 if they wanted. Those Kevin Porter Jr. and Jay Sean Tate contracts are easily movable. And if you're bringing in a Harden or Fred Van Fleet, then Kevin Porter Jr. is definitely expendable. He wouldn't be your starting point guard. At that point, he would be basically a a combo guard, a shooter, someone operating off ball. In a perfect world, would I like to keep him? Yes. But at the end of the day, if you needed to clear a bit more cap room to bring in more defense, more veterans, could you offload Kevin Porter Jr. and then replace him using the room exception for, say, a Seth Curry type? Yeah, I think you absolutely could. So I just want to throw that in there. When we're talking about these names and some people saying, well, how does that fit with the 60 million? You could actually increase that 60 million to 75 to 80 if you wanted to, because I do think those KPJ and Jay Sean Tate deals basically expirings and both players at reasonable ages in their 20s. I, I do think you could offload them if you need to. Yeah, and th- those two-year deals kind of work with the idea of, again, kicking the can down the road, getting one more bite at the apple because you give yourself a little bit of that runway for Ime Odoka to evaluate the players, kind of see where guys are at, give 
Jalen, Shingun, Jabari, Tari, all these young guys, another year or two to kind of figure out, okay, who are these guys as players, right? Do we see one of these guys take the leap? One of the biggest, you know, debates, discussions amongst Rockets fans has been, okay, we don't clearly have a guy yet. We don't have like the best player on a championship team, a him, if you will. And (laughs) Scoot Henderson. <laughs> Scoot Henderson. Um, no, but look, right, and and look, the Rockets might get that guy in the draft this year, right? And maybe it's not Scoot Henderson. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe he falls to number four. Maybe they walk away with Amon Thompson. Uh, maybe Brandon Miller's all the way down at four. We still don't know how this draft is ultimately going to play out, so that is absolutely one of the factors to consider moving forward. I think if they do land Scoot Henderson somehow, if he does plummet to pick number four, I think the conversation surrounding Harden and Fred Van Vliet becomes moot because then, then like, that's your guy. That's your starting point guard moving forward. And then you can allocate those resources elsewhere. Maybe it does become something like a bunch of those two-year deals. And I wouldn't be opposed to giving a balloon payment to Dylan Brooks for one year, right? A one-year balloon payment. And then he's off on his merry way at Mm. the end of next season. And you just bring him in for one season, whether he's your starting three or you bring him off the bench and he's just that tough, hard-nosed veteran, whatever journeyman guy who can, you know, instill some confidence in these young guys. Sure. Brooke Lopez makes a ton of sense to me. I think he's very easily a guy that, you know, he's making, he was making, I think like 14 million in Milwaukee. You give him a $20 million deal. I think he, it's going to be really hard for him to say no to that. And I have a hard time believing that any other legitimate contenders, Milwaukee included, would be able to match that price point for him or would be even willing to match that price point for him at this point. So it's all about whether or not, it's all kind of about what he wants, right? If he wants to chase the bag, awesome. If he's still wanting to compete and push for titles and he's bought into what Adrian Griffin is going to try to accomplish in Milwaukee, then maybe he stays put. But but those are some of the factors that we have to consider here. And I feel like a lot of NBA fans don't necessarily consider all the yeah. variables here he when we talk be, about free agents. Yeah. And he could be a casualty of the new CBA too, which makes it really difficult to keep a team like that together with beyond just the top two or three to keep expensive role players. When you have big name stars, like obviously Giannis and Drew Holiday, but the reports have come out. It was in the Jake Fisher article today that they really want to keep Middleton as well. And apparently there's been some positive dialogue there. Well, all of a sudden, if you have Giannis, you have Holiday, and then you strike a new deal with Middleton, all of a sudden, there's got to be a crunch somewhere. You've got Bobby Bobby Portis on the books as well. Brooke Lopez might be, you know, the type of role player that's a bit of a casualty with the new CBA, which makes it really difficult to keep those super teams together. Yeah, at this point, uh, you know, there there's some there's some significant signs after after so much. Yeah. Fire and smoke yeah. about Harden to Houston. I feel like also, there's enough stuff happening with it's, where it's point. It, my, my gut's telling me that it might not happen at this point. Yeah, I mean, I've started and the the Shams report today really crystallizes it because that's what I was waiting on to finally see what's going to happen when Harden's camp gets the message that you know it's not the way it was in 2018, 2019. They want him, but they want him with conditions what's going to happen. And I think we're now starting to figure that out. And again, my gut still tells me that at some point Philadelphia blinks because they just have so much to lose. If he walks, they don't have a direct avenue to replace him. It doesn't sound like they have to this point, but this does at least create a pathway to where you could see that happening. And again, the Rockets, by you know leaking these types of names, it's clear that they do have other options as well. It's not like the Rockets are desperate. I do think they do and should want James Harden back if he's willing to take a short-term deal, if he's willing to do it under the right conditions, but they shouldn't be desperate. They should, if he's looking for a four-year max or anything close to that, be willing to look down the list. And, you know, optionality is a big part of it. Again, it's the optionality. That's why I had such a draw to James Harden once I started hearing that maybe, you know, a one or two year type deal could be doable. Well, I think you have to look at the the entire free agent marketplace that way. You know, you mentioned it with Dylan. I've seen a lot of people during the playoffs talk about Bruce Brown, who is a bit lower maintenance than Dylan Brooks and can do a lot of the same things. Well, because Bruce Brown is a bit lower maintenance than Dylan Brooks and because he's a key role player on what could soon be the NBA champions, then he's probably in position to get a three or four year deal. Whereas Dylan Brooks, because of the baggage, I, I, I might actually make him a candidate to take a one or two year deal like you were talking about. And so that sort of gives you the optionality. You could keep him if it works out. It could also give you another bite at the apple with regards to having salary cap flexibility one or two years down the line. So I think, you know, that optionality is going to be a theme for the Rockets as they go through this process. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you could look at trade candidates as well in terms of, you know, trying to rent a player. Chris Paul is someone that's been thrown out before. Maybe Gordon Hayward in Charlotte, you could potentially look to sort of rent your space out that way and take on more assets because if the Rockets, you know, free agency is one way, you could also trade for, you know, a star down the line and they have some draft assets, but not a ton. 
conceivably, you can rent out some of that space and take on, you know, a larger contract if it sort of helps you now and you also get a first round draft pick that might be good in exchange for doing that, then that's an option as well. The point is you just got to be creative and, you know, keep the optionality in mind as you go through this process. Optionality is our new buzzword here at Locked on Rockets. We are locked on optionality for today's episode. Ben, on that note, let everybody know where they can track you down at. Yep. The logger line on Twitter, the Rockets Wire on Twitter, Ben Dubose on Twitter, and RocketsWire.USHToday.com for all of your daily Houston Rockets news coverage. And at optionality on Twitter. And that's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, all that good stuff. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.